Hello everyone. Hope you're all well. Today we're going to talk about Maria Monk, the Canadian author who shocked the world with her controversial book called Awful Disclosures of Maria Monk, or The Hidden Secrets of a Nun's Life in a Convent Exposed. In it, she alleged widespread sexual exploitation of nuns and the killing of their newborns by Catholic priests within her Montreal convent. The book was a massive bestseller when it was released, but there were a few small problems with this book of secrets. Who really wrote it? Was it Maria, or was it her co-writer who penned most of the content to suit his purposes? Or were there others behind this obvious piece of titillating propaganda? Maria said she was a nun in a French-speaking convent for seven years, but she didn't speak a lick of French and she wasn't a nun. She was a resident of an asylum during the time that she said she was in the nunnery. Three inquiries concluded that there was no evidence to support the claims she made in her book. She knew very little, if anything, about the order of nuns or the convent she was supposed to be a member of. There were many inconsistencies in her story. Apart from all these things, the book seemed to be fine. No, not really. The book was a hoax, I'm afraid. A work of fiction masquerading as a memoir. It was concocted by some troublemaking Protestants trying to drum up anti-Catholic propaganda. I find this strange because surely there were plenty of genuine Catholic scandals they could have written books about. I mean, we know enough about such scandals these days to fill lots of books. As well as that, as I said, Maria was in an asylum for several years called the Magdalene Asylum for Wayward Girls. I'm sure she could have written a very salacious book that was much closer to the truth. But no, those Protestants wanted to score cheap political points. And it was political, because politics and religion were very closely intertwined in those days, not like today. Maria Monk's book was released in January 1836. In this book, she alleged that the nuns from the Hotel Dieu convent in Montreal, which wasn't a hotel, but a hospital, excuse my French, were forced to have sex with priests from the neighbouring seminary. She claimed these priests accessed the convent via a hidden tunnel. Not sure if the patients got involved in any of these shenanigans. Any children resulting from these unions were baptised and then strangled, their bodies discarded in a lime pit located in the convent's basement. Additionally, she stated that nuns who resisted or were non-compliant mysteriously vanished. Presumably they were killed. All pretty gruesome stuff. But the public loved it, especially Protestant readers in the United States and Canada, turning it into a huge hit. I want to say at this point that this is not an anti-Protestant video, by the way. I'm only telling the story of what happened. Many of these conflicts were rooted in socio-economic issues rather than genuine religious differences. Disenfranchised and struggling individuals were often steered to blame fellow impoverished people instead of addressing the wealth disparities perpetuated by the people who held all the money. We are lucky this doesn't happen anymore, eh? Anyhow, that's just my opinion. Numerous reprints and editions testify to the book's widespread readership, cementing its place in American publishing history. This is even after everyone knew it was a hoax. Before the advent of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, Monk's work was among the most widely read books in the United States. Coincidentally, in Boston a couple of years earlier, another controversy raged. The Ursuline Convent Riots of 1834 saw a mob burning down a convent, fuelled by rumours of a nun held captive. Lyman Beecher, an influential preacher and father to Harriet Beecher Stowe, faced accusations of sparking this violence with his ardent anti-Catholic oratory. The gravity of Maria Monk's allegations was not taken lightly. Flurry of reactions was set off in both religious and political circles, demanding thorough investigations. The public, having been riveted by Monk's narrative, were eager to know if the stories held any merit. This led to multiple inquiries from various groups, each keen to unearth the truth behind the controversial, awful disclosures. The Hotel Dieu convent, faced with accusations that could severely tarnish its reputation, took an extraordinary measure. In a bid to clear its name and quell the growing storm of rumours, the convent threw open its doors to the general public. This was an unparalleled move especially given the unusual private nature of religious institutions. Their hope was that by allowing individuals to freely tour and inspect their premises, they could refute monks' claims transparently, restoring faith in their establishment and the broader Catholic community. The local bishop spearheaded one inquiry, meticulously examining the convent and its operations. His findings, 
no evidence to substantiate Monk's tales. Furthermore, an independent committee, devoid of any religious bias, also took up the mantle to examine Monk's narrative critically. Their conclusion mirrored that of the bishops, pointing out various inconsistencies and discrepancies in Monk's account. Among those who took a keen interest in Monk's narrative was Colonel William Leedstone Sr., an esteemed editor from New York. Recognising the immense implications of Monk's claims, Stone personally embarked on a detailed investigation of the Hotel Dieu convent. After thorough scrutiny, his findings echoed the sentiments of previous investigations. Stone found no corroborating evidence to support Monk's sensational stories, further casting doubt on the authenticity of her awful disclosures. At this time, America was a cauldron of tension and mistrust. Waves of Catholic immigrants from countries like Ireland and Germany were seen with suspicion by native-born Americans, giving rise to a movement called nativism. This theme is also depicted in Herbert Ashby's book The Gangs of New York, later adapted into a movie by Martin Scorsese. This ideology, which favoured the native-born over immigrants, saw the Catholic faith as a threat to American values. Nativism is still alive today, with the perceived threat mostly coming from a different direction. Monk's revelations found a resonance in the broader nativist sentiment. The narrative seemingly offered evidence to those fearful of Catholic influences, further amplifying their concern about these immigrants' loyalty to America over the Pope. This wasn't merely a societal trend. Nativism found its political voice, giving birth to entities like the Know Nothing Party that championed strict immigration laws. The book's legacy is not just rooted in its sales or popularity, but also in the discussions it generated. It became a focal point of debates on Catholicism, immigration and nativism in America. Furthermore, its success also highlighted the American public's appetite for controversial content, especially when it tapped into existing societal fears and prejudices while Uncle Tom's Cabin would soon overshadow Monk's book in terms of both sales and societal impact, Awful Disclosures remains a key work in understanding the religious and social tensions of its time. The staying power of such a divisive book underscores the complexity of 19th century America, where literature could both reflect and amplify societal divides. The mystery surrounding Maria Monk's awful disclosures is deepened by questions about the true origins of its content and the extent to which Maria herself contributed to the narrative. The split between her personal recollections and the input from her co-writer remains unresolved. A prevalent theory speculates that the narrative might have been shaped by the Gothic novels that were very popular during the 19th century. Characterised by its dark atmospheric settings, mysterious events and often sinister religion undertones, Gothic novels captured the imagination of readers, weaving tales of suspense and horror. The Gothic genre is known for its haunting landscapes, decaying castle and secretive, often tormented characters. A recurring theme in many Gothic novels is the portrayal of corrupt, mysterious or malevolent religious establishments. These narratives frequently delve into the hidden, darker side of humanity and institutions, presenting a contrast to the Enlightenment's focus on reason and rationality. Maria Monk's awful disclosures bore several hallmarks of Gothic literature, albeit presented as a true account. Her descriptions of the Hotel Dieu nunnery, with its secret tunnels, hidden chambers and alleged sinister activities, closely mirrored the atmospheric settings of Gothic novels. Furthermore, the alleged victimisation of innocent nuns and the oppressive, controlling priests could be likened to the archetypal damsel in distress and the malevolent antagonist often found in Gothic tales. The immense popularity of Gothic novels at the time meant that audiences were primed for tales of horror and intrigue. Monk's account, whether intentional or not, tapped into this existing appetite, presented a narrative that resonated with the fictional stories readers were familiar with. But this is a bit like blaming video games for mass shootings. This might explain, in part, why her revelations were so readily consumed by the public, despite their shocking nature. Yet, the more pressing question remains, how much of this tale stemmed from Maria's own memories? One theory postulates that she suffered a brain injury in her youth, which might have impaired her ability to discern fact from fiction. 
rather than explain her recollection abilities. This could suggest a heightened vulnerability to manipulation, making her an ideal conduit for others with ulterior motives to shape and sell a sensational story. Co-writer of the book was William H. Holt, Monk's legal guardian and a known anti-Catholic activist. William H. Holt was not just a passive guardian to Maria Monk. As an ardent anti-Catholic activist, he held strong views against the Catholic Church. His association with Monk and his active role in bringing her story to the public raised eyebrows, with many speculating about the extent of his influence on her narrative. Given Holt's staunch anti-Catholic stance, many historians and critics believed that numerous details in Awful Disclosures bore his imprint. The suspicion is that he might have shaped, exaggerated or even fabricated parts of Monk's account to align with his own views and the broader anti-Catholic agenda of the time. The book's immense success, both in terms of readership and financial gains, inevitably led to disputes among those involved in its creation and publication. A significant point of contention arose when the writers, including Holt, got embroiled in legal battles over the distribution of the book's considerable profits. These disputes revealed the lucrative nature of sensational literature during that era and raised questions about the true intentions behind the book's publication. In a tragic turn of events, amidst the legal wrangling and profit sharing among the writers and publishers, Maria Monk, the central figure of the narrative, was left in a state of destitution. This outcome further fueled the belief that Monk might have been exploited by those around her, using her story for their gain, leaving her without the financial support she might have expected from the book's success. Following the uproar from awful disclosures, Maria Monk relocated to Philadelphia, hoping for a new beginning away from the criticism in New York. In Philadelphia, she penned a sequel to her initial book, though it lacked the success of its predecessor. Personal challenges arose when Maria had a child out of wedlock in 1838, an event heavily stigmatised at the time. This, along with continued doubts about her claims, caused many supporters to abandon her. As public interest waned, Maria faced increasing hardships and sought stability in her later years. Although her immediate influence faded, the debates her story ignited persisted in historical discussions. Maria Monk passed away in 1849 in Blackwell's Island, New York. She was only 32. Or possibly 33. You never know with Maria. I hope you enjoyed the story of Maria Monk and her awful disclosures. Tune in next time for more historical tidbits. Slancha.